when I have enough money, when I have the time, when the economy is better, when I'm married. I have found that when has become the greatest thief of purpose. And I believe that when has diminished purpose more than even sin. See, the enemy doesn't have to get us bad to rob our lives. He can just get us scared and uncertain and watch us stand still. Show of hands if at some point in life, recently or over the years, you would admit right now in front of everybody that you at one point or another have had fear or uncertainty at play in your life. Show of hands. Go on. Fear and uncertainty. It, it, all of us in here, and for those of us who maybe didn't raise our hand, you're a liar. Um, so <laughs> we've all experienced fear and uncertainty in, in one situation or another, whether it's situational fear and situational uncertainty, or you're looking at the future, or, um, or maybe even looking at your past. Some of us have looked at our past and been like, is my past going to catch up with me, right? Like we've all been there at one point or another in different various ways. Well, on vacation recently, I found myself playing a game by myself in the mornings as I sat on a, on a deck that was attached to an Airbnb that we had, and, and I drank my coffee. And this is the game that I play often to just keep myself um, amused. I will play games in my mind. It's just how my mind works. And so these particular days is I would get up, and I would read my Bible and do some study, and then I would sit there for a little bit, because where we were at, we were on this, on this mountain in the woods, and there was this beautiful breeze that would happen every single day. The wind would blow. There's aspen trees out front, and big redwood trees around us. And so I would play this game. I would try to guess which way the wind was going to go because the wind was always shifting. Now, this may sound dumb to you, but it was fun to me. And so I sat there and, and one minute the wind would be going one direction and then I would guess, oh, like, it's gonna go the op, I pick a different, it's gonna go left on me. But how many of you know it didn't go left on me? It came straight at my face. And, and at one moment it's going north and then the next minute it's heading south and the next minute it's swirling and I could, I could, never, I could never get it right. And as often as I, I thought, okay, this is the time that I'm gonna nail down which direction the wind was going, how many of you know I never pegged it? Not even by luck did I peg which way the wind was going to go. And here's the problem with many of us and the, the things that we face in life is that we are so afraid because we don't have the ability to control what the future is going to do. Because of uncertainty, because of the shifting winds in the world in which we live, we find ourselves caught up with fear and uncertainty. And many of us, day in, day out, we're trying to play the same game with the world that we live in as I was playing with the wind. I'm trying to figure out which direction it's going to go. We try to do it in our culture. We try to do it in our economy. We try to do it in our politics. We try to do it in all these different places. And many of us right now, we are scrambling right now to try to get some sort of handle around what is happening in our world so that we can assuage the fear and the uncertainty that is percolating inside of us. And the writer here, Solomon, as he writes to us this wisdom literature, he said, hey, listen, I just want to remind you about something, that tomorrow you will never be able to peg down what is going to happen happen tomorrow. So if you watch the wind, if you're not careful, it will stop you from actually doing something. And many of us have, have been laid out by uncertainty and fear, and we've just been standing staring at the future ahead of us. So my job today, my, my mission, honestly, is really simple, and it's just to encourage us today. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna say this, is that this is not one of those happy, clappy messages where it's like, I'm just gonna tell you, everybody be happy and joyful and clap all the time and say, God is good. Can we all acknowledge God's good? Yes. Can we also acknowledge stuff happens? So I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about burying our heads in the sand. I'm not talking about ignoring things. I'm not talking about one of those people who doesn't realize the scope of life. Things are happening all the time around us. But what Solomon is saying is, hey, listen, in the midst of it all, don't stop doing things. In other words, someone needs to write this down today. Don't stop living. Don't stop making decisions. Don't stop laughing. We'll talk about it in a minute. Don't stop living the life that God has for you. Why? Well, Caleb's message right here, fear is inevitable. I know, super positive and encouraging. Did you know uncertainty is a guarantee? How we handle it is the question. And so this message is about learning how to handle fear 
and uncertainty. And if one is observant, one can quickly see that there are many reasons that one could become full of fear and uncertainty. Living in the world that we do has a way of doing that to us. But it's not who we've been designed to be. The Bible tells us that we haven't been given a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, the Bible's not talking about ignoring things once again. I, I, I want to harp on this thing because I think Christians have gotten a bad rap that we just kind of bury our head in the sand and everything's like, how are you doing? You're like, blessed. <laughs> and it's not true. You may be blessed, but things still hurt. You may be blessed, but the body's still sick. You may be blessed, but cancer still showed up. Y'all see what I'm talking about? You may be blessed, but you still lost the job. So there's this weird duality of like, I'm a realist. I live in the real world, but I am deciding right now that I'm not going to be afraid. I'm deciding right now that I'm not going to be the type of person that stands paralyzed by uncertainty. Oh, but Jason, you know, the gas is getting more expensive. Yep. And it's going to, man, you know, the economy's changing. Yep. And it's going to, you know, that my, my job is shifting. Yep. And they are going to, everything is going to change. You will never know which way the wind is going, but can I encourage you like Solomon did? Do not give up on sowing. Do not give up on plowing. Do not give up on getting up every single day and doing what God has called you to do. Yeah. So I want to encourage us today, don't let fear run your game. Solomon challenged us to understand that we're not meant to negotiate life through fear and uncertainty. Instead, we're meant to do life with a measure of faith and courage. But I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people right now stand still because of fear and uncertainty rather than making progress with faith and courage. I love how the author of the New American Commentary puts it, and they write this, one cannot use the possibility, and this is what many of us do, one cannot use the possibility of misfortune as an excuse for inactivity. Someone who is forever afraid of storms will never get around to working in his field. The teacher, in effect, says, just face the fact that things may go wrong, but get out there and do your work anyway. I love that idea. Do I have any football fans in the house today? Where are my football fans at? Right, okay. Um, I have a football team that I cheer for. It's the Seattle Seahawks. I like, I like them. <laughs> Man, people are ruthless. But but there are a few people there are a few people I'm afraid of. Okay, Raiders fans, and there's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> but the people that fascinate me are are like the East Coast teams, specifically Detroit and Packers fans, Indianapolis fans. Those people are crazy. <laughs> Have you seen these people? These are the people that will go to a that will go to a game when it is 97 degrees below zero. <laughs> Snow is coming from every direction and from the ground, okay? And these knuckleheads are out there cheering their team on in parkas. And some of them with no parkas. You've seen those guys. They got no shirts on, right? They've written on, the, and I, got, I know they have extra installation most of the time those guys are. <laughs> but if we're, if we're honest about it, those people freak my mind out. There's nobody, have you seen those pictures? There's nobody in the stadium except for those 17 people. <laughs> and, I, and, and there's this line, I, I look at them and I go, okay, you love your team and you are crazy. Like that's the line that, I, that I'm sitting on with those people. And, and they are not what I am. What I am is what we call a fair weather fan. Come on, how many, how many fair weather fans? You're like, it's got to be 70 and sunny for me to, for me to sit outside today. Like, the, we've got fair weather fans. People where all the conditions have to be right in order to do what it is that you want to do. Some of you know where I'm going with this. We've got too many fair weather Christians. I will live my faith when the conditions are the way that I want the conditions to be. But if there's a slight breeze on Sunday, I'm staying home. Uh-oh. If there is a slight breeze on Tuesday, then I'm going to back up. And we are looking for conditions in our faith that will never exist because faith and courage from the Lord happens when conditions are not the way that we want them. Come on, somebody, to be. And so I'll say it like this, write this down if you're taking notes. Worry is never a good enough reason to not do anything. Warren Worsby, a commentator, a theologian, would write this. If you're looking for an excuse for, not, for doing nothing, you can find it. <laughs> I love that idea. 
So this is what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34, he says this. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. You're like, ha, that's a great idea, Jesus. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a moment? I love this question. Jesus is getting philosophical on us. He says, can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? How many of you have ever added an extra day to your life by worrying? That's what he's asking. How many of you have made your life better by worrying? Why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor, Solomon's the one who wrote this portion of Ecclesiastes for us. Even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here to today, thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you have little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be provided for you. Therefore, and then Jesus gives this like, ending to his teaching. And he says, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. And then he says this, I love this. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You're like, thank you, Jesus, that's great. (laughs) But here's what I've come to realize that for many of us, the reason that we are so fearful of the future is because we've borrowed problems from the future and brought it into our today. Come on, y'all with me? Some of you have gone, you've gone a year in advance and you're thinking about the cancer that could be or could not be described over your life and you're worrying about it today. Some of you just got hired for that job and you're concerned that you're going to lose the job. Y'all see what I'm talking about? The problem that many of us are facing is that we are borrowing problems of tomorrow and inserting them into our today. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, listen, stop worrying about tomorrow. Trust me, today has plenty of problems. Why take the ones from tomorrow and bring them into today? And this is why so many of us live with fear and uncertainty. So what I want to do is I've got uh, eight thoughts for us to wrestle with today. I've been on vacation, got a high word count. Here we go, okay? (laughs) Eight thoughts. We're going to try to buzz through the first four as fast as we possibly can. And and here's what we're going to do is we're going to now shift over to a book in the Bible called Numbers. It's in the Old Testament. We're going to extract some thoughts from there about this fear and uncertainty thing. And then we're going to shift our focus back to Ecclesiastes to land the plane on this thing and explain a little bit more what Solomon is writing to us. And so the story I want to take us to is is a story found in Numbers. And it's a conversation that ensues just after these 12 spies that Moses had sent into the promised land that God was leading them into come back to give Moses and the children of Israel kind of a rundown of what's going to be happening in their future. And so Moses says, hey guys, I need you to go into the promised land. I want you to spy it out. I want you to figure out what's going on there. Figure out the situation. Come back and tell us the situation. So we pick up on the story. Numbers 13, verse 26 26 says this. The men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. So everybody's standing around. They brought back a report for them in the whole community. And they showed them the fruit of the land. In other words, they're like, hey, check this out. This is what we found in the promised land. And they reported, verse 27, to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us, and indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. Now notice, they are, they are regurgitating the promise that was put over them by God. Those are God's words. It's a, a land flowing with milk and honey. And here's some of its fruit. Like, look at this fruit. We got this in there, and it's in D. Guys, it's awesome. It's flowing. The grass is tall. It's beautiful. It's green. There's not a drought. There's grapes, watermelon, and kiwis, star fruit. I just threw that one out there. (laughs) However, the people living in the land, does anybody get concerned when people throw in howevers? Have you ever been in that moment where somebody comes to you like, hey, can I say something to you? And they're like, hey, Pastor Jason, that message was so good, but, (laughs) and in that moment, my mind's like, brace yourself, (laughs) right? (laughs) However, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. 
We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Je all the Ites, they live there in the hill country. <laughs> then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses. I love Caleb. I love Caleb's spirit. Caleb's like, hey, everybody, be quiet. You're all giving a bad report. And he says to Moses, let us go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. Come on, does anybody ever, does anybody have like a person in your life that can just quiet everything and be like, come on, let's do this right now. We got to go make this happen, right? This is who Caleb was. But the men who had gone up with him responded, we cannot attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative, we shout negative? negative, negative report to the Israelites about the land that they had scouted. The land they, we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. Now, I want you to listen to this last statement, okay? Look at the words very closely as we study Scripture today. This is really important. To our what? Let's, let's do it one, one more time. To our what? Ourselves. Say it one more time. Our what? Ourselves. To ourselves. We seemed like grasshoppers. Now, I want you to watch this assumption that takes place. And we must have seen the same to them. They had no sufficient evidence to know what the people living in the land thought of them. They viewed themselves a certain way, and then they made an assumption about how others viewed them as well. There's a powerful reality that's taking place here. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk really quickly. Four things that fear and uncertainty cause in our lives. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do while, while we go through these things. As you're writing notes, I want you to peg yourself. I want you to take a moment, if you can just step back, because a lot of us listen to a message. How many of you have ever done this before? You're listening to the message, you're like, man, I wish Jenny was here to listen to that message, right? Don't do that, okay? This message isn't for Jenny or Joe. This message is for you. So, so I want you to like lean in if you can as you write these. I want you to see if you can peg yourself on this like kind of fear factor scale. Where are you with fear and uncertainty when, when we look at some of these behaviors? So here, here's the first one. Come on, ever shot number one? Here's the first thing I want us to understand about fear and uncertainty is that fear and uncertainty cause us to develop a skewed vision of life. Skewed vision of life. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us, and indeed it is flowing with milk and honey. And here is some of its fruit. However, the people in, in the land, they're strong. The cities are large and fortified. And so they would go on to say, hey, listen, indeed there's great blessing in this promised land. But instead of seeing what was there and what was promised to them, they allowed the people living there to override the promise. And instead of stepping into the promised land that God had for them, they were cool with deciding to hold back and they then begin to develop a skewed vision for their life. They saw something, but because of fear and uncertainty, it twisted what they saw. Has anybody ever been there before? Yeah. Have you ever been in a moment where fear and uncertainty creeps in and it twists what you see? Yeah. And if we're not careful, we can allow fear and uncertainty to skew our vision for things. So I'll, I'll give you a very, very personal one for me, just a little moment of transparency and vulnerability. I am starting my master's degree on August 21st. I'm continuing on with my education to get some other stuff done and, and make way for some other stuff. So guys, I got the syllabus just a couple days ago. <laughs> Syllabi, syllabus, syllabuses. Um, so <laughs> two of them for the, the, the classes that I'm taking. It's this cohort for senior pastors, executive leaders. And um, I'm not gonna lie to you. I was super pumped about doing, like continuing with my master's degree. Then I got those documents and I got afraid because I looked at the workload, I looked at the papers, I looked at all the things that I had to do. They're using language that I don't even understand right now. And I'm like, what is going on? And so what happened is where I had a vision and so much excitement, if I'm honest with you, just the syllabus yeah. skewed my vision. Why? Because I started to remember when someone once said, hey, I don't know if you're smart enough to do this, or you failed skipping in kindergarten. <laughs> or asking your mom if they fed you sugar cereal in the morning. Like, those are some of the things that crept back up in my mind. And I had to make the decision, listen, I am not going to be led by fear and uncertainty, but I'm gonna step into what I know that God has called me, come on somebody, to 
do. Even things like people have said, like, do you really need to do that? Like, you're operating in everything that you want to. Yeah, yeah, because I have some things that God is doing in my heart and some things that I know he's asked me to do. And so I've got to look fear and uncertainty in the face on this thing and go, listen, today, today's the decision I make to go, I'm not going to be led by fear and uncertainty. Some of you need to make this happen in your life right now. Because fear and uncertainty has skewed your vision for life. And here's what I've realized. If you allow it to skew your vision for life long enough, you will eventually have no vision for life. You'll, just, you'll have no vision for your marriage. You'll have no vision for your relationships. You'll have no vision for your walk with Jesus. You'll have no vision for your job. You'll have no vision for your, you, you fill in the blanks. Listen, the spies lost vision for the future because of what they saw and became afraid of. Here's the second thing, everybody shout number two. Fear and uncertainty cause us to hesitate rather than initiate. Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go now, take possession of the land because we can conquer it. But the men who had gone up with him responded, we can't attack the people because they are stronger than we. They had no sufficient evidence to support that. They just had what they saw. They were watching the wind. And they came to the conclusion, we can't beat them. And fear and, and, fear and hesitate, like fear and uncertainty will cause us to hesitate rather than initiate. I found myself cliff diving with my son on this vacation. My son is into this stuff called death diving. Horrible name. Have you guys heard of this before? Death diving. This is what they do. They, they get up on a cliff or a boulder and they jump off of it. They grab their legs like this and then they go into the water like this. And so... My son starts doing it, and I was like, well, I can do it. <laughs> so he initiated in, in death diving, and I initiated in middle-aged man flailing off of a rock diving, okay? <laughs> That's what I initiated in. And so, but it was a blast. We were jumping off all of these boulders and rocks and, and having a great time. And so on one of the boulders that we're on, it was a pretty, pretty high boulder. This family, they were from, uh, they were from the UK, and uh, they got up on the rock, and the dad was there. And I knew we had a situation going on because this was one of those families where they had zinc on their nose and they were in full body suits. And they, so I was like, I don't know if they've swam before. Um, <laughs> so, but they get up on the rock and they're, they're discussing. So this guy's daughter comes over and, and she's like, daddy, daddy, I'm going to jump. And I was like, don't do it, please. Don't, don't, don't do it. And this is what he says to her. And I'm listening to this whole conversation. This is what he says to her. He goes, baby girl, listen, if you're going to jump, don't hesitate. Because if you hesitate, you will get hurt. Because dad had looked over the edge of this rock we were jumping off of and realized that we were having to throw ourselves so far off of this rock because there was another boulder that we were having to clear just below it. And that dad knew that if his little girl took off running and then hesitated because she got scared, how many of you know she's not cliff jumping anymore? She's cliff falling. And this is how many of us operate in life. It wasn't the thing in front of you that hurt you. It was your hesitation that hurt you. Let it process. Let it, let it sink in. Some of you have been dating for seven and a half years. And it's killing you. Come on. you got. Some of you have been engaged for seven and a half years. Stop hesitating. Let's move into something. Some of you have been believing God for that business far too long. You've been asked by God to go on that trip for far too long, to take that class, to do the thing. Can I just tell you this today? Hesitation is still disobedience. There's like seven of us over here, so I'm going to stay on this side. <laughs> but this is how many of us are negotiating life right now is that we're, we're hesitating. And if we're not careful, the hesitation will hurt us. Let me say it like this way. This, this point is for all of, those, all of us who love the word when. When I have enough money. When I have the time. When the economy is better. When I'm married. When I have. You, you, you fill in the blank. Y'all see what I'm talking about here? I have found that when has become the greatest thief of purpose. And I believe that when has diminished purpose more than even sin. 
See, the enemy doesn't have to get us bad to rob our lives. He can just get us scared and uncertain and watch us stand still. I think, the, I think that win has robbed the church of its purpose. It's amazing how many churches lay themselves on the altar of win because of fear and uncertainty. Can I just tell you, for this, for this house, no matter what happens in the world around us, we are committed to keeping on going. We're committed to reaching our city and reaching the people that so desperately need love and compassion and care no matter what is happening around us. Come on, is anybody with me in church today? We had plenty of people go when we started to move into this building reality. We had plenty of people go like, are you sure? You want to know my answer? No. I'm not sure. I've never been sure about anything. But what I have decided is I'm not going to be paralyzed by watching the wind. I don't know which direction it's going to go. Last one, I love this one, uh, talking about what fear and uncertainty do to us. Fear and uncertainty cause us to become cynical rather than faithful. Woo. Have you ever noticed that cynicism has come with a badge of honor today? The more cynical you can get, the more distorted your views on things. So I love this. Well, we even saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. They come from the Nephilim. And to ourselves, to ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. And we must have seemed that way to them. Cynicism is the opposite of faith-filled expectation. Cynics are those who see the world and life through a lens of negativity and a lack of expectation. I heard someone say even recently that if you don't expect anything, listen to this, then you can't get hurt. Someone once said that cynicism is what they call defensive ethics. In other words, that right there, if you don't expect anything, then you can't get hurt. So those type of people, they don't engage in relationships with people. Why? Because if I don't have friends, I can't get hurt. They refuse to do new things in life because if I, step, like if, if I don't have any expectations in life and I don't step out on new things, then I can't be embarrassed. There's all kinds of things that we stop ourselves from doing because we have a cynical mindset. And what I, what I find interesting about the children of Israel is they looked at themselves and they believed themselves to be a certain thing. And then here's the deal. They imposed their view of themselves on this other party in the promised land. They said, because we see ourselves this way, they must see ourselves this way. Who's to say that all those people living in the promised land didn't look at them and go, oh, we're in trouble? We don't know the perspective of all the ites living in the land, but we do know that the children of Israel refused to go into the promised land because they viewed themselves a certain way, not because of what was said to them by those occupying the promised land. They hesitated into the promised land because of how they viewed themselves. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers. So cynics love to impose their doubt, their fear, their insecurity, and their uncertainty onto others. Because the spies viewed themselves in one way. They viewed their entire party, the children of Israel, in that way. I love Caleb. Caleb was like, that's not me. Mm -mm. Caleb's like, you look like a grasshopper. I'm Hulk. Right? Like, that's how he... <laughs> He's like, let's do this. Let's, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Why? Because God has promised us this land. So as we close today, I want to look at four decisions. Y'all find yourself pegged somewhere in those four places. Where might you be when it comes to fear and uncertainty? What one of those might you be dealing with? I'd venture to, I'd venture to guess that you could quickly find out by what you post on Facebook or Instagram. You can quickly find out by just simply soliciting information from the people that are closest to you. Be like, are any of these me? I'm pretty sure they'll quickly come up with where you might be on this spectrum. But the truth is this, is that we don't have to live according to fear and uncertainty. How? Four decisions we have to make today. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. Number one, the first thing is this, is that we must decide to diversify. Now, I'm not teaching you about your portfolio right now. That is not what I'm talking about. And this is not even a material thing. Solomon is using this idea to help people understand something. He says, send your bread on the surface of the water. 
Take what you have and put it out there. And for after many days, you may find it. Give a portion. He didn't say just one or two. He says, give a portion to seven or even eight, for you don't know what disaster may happen on earth. So this is what he says. If you take what you have and you put it on seven or eight ships, four may go down, but you have four more. But some of us will not live our lives that way. He's saying, take what you have in your life and actually do something with it. Yes, you don't know what wind will blow tomorrow. But can I tell you, if you diversify your life a little bit, if you open up your life a little bit, if you become less skewed in your vision, less myopic in your vision, you start looking broader, you start looking bigger, you start believing higher. If you actually do that, no matter what happens in the world around you, you will still have something less left to praise God for. You've got to diversify. Can I just say this to someone? This is a practice. This is a message from a pastor's heart. Open up your friendships. You need more than one. Pick up a hobby, serve, give, turn off the TV. Stop scrolling. Some of us scroll because we're looking for problems. Make the most of the life that God has given you. This is the wisdom that's being shared with us from Solomon. You and I can overcome fear and uncertainty by deciding to live a big, full, and expansive life in Christ Jesus. Number two, second thing we got to decide is we must decide to observe rather than obsess. One who watches the wind will not sow, and the one who looks at the clouds will not reap. So. We're on this rock, jumping off with Europeans, <laughs> doing death dives. And on this particular day, this massive storm started to roll in. So we're standing on these big boulders out in the middle of the lake that you have to swim to. So you're out there. And we watched the storm, and the storm and it was gathering, and you could start hearing thunder in the distance. And this particular lake where we're at, they get big thunderstorms during the summertime. And so we're standing on the rock, and my kids are jumping off. And then I'm watching them, and I'm watching the storm. I'm watching them, and I'm watching the storm. And this is what my son says to me. He comes to me because I'm not jumping anymore. He says, Dad, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm watching the storm. I'm trying to figure out what these big, massive thunderheads are going to do. As if I know, I'm like taking water and sprinkling it in the air and like, <laughs> like I'm a human barometer or something like that. So I'm paying attention. And this is what my son says. He goes, how long are you going to do this? I thought we were jumping together. And I realized in that moment, I'm missing out on something because I'm trying to figure out something else that I have no ability to figure out. I was obsessing over the thunderstorm. And if I'm really honest with you, Erica knows this about me. I was obsessing because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, one of us could get hit by lightning. It's true. If you're like, my mind just goes, I'm, I'm thinking shapes and colors. So I'm like, if this gets close enough, I'm going to be the one who gets hit by lightning because <laughs> that happens too. And I'm obsessing, I'm obsessing, I'm obsessing, I'm obsessing. And my son's just saying, will you come jump with us? You're missing out on what is over here because you've moved from observation to obsession. And some of us are so riddled with stress and fear right now because you are obsessing over details you cannot control. You're obsessing over the election right now. <laughs> Can we get the overseers back? Um, <laughs> you're obsessing over the economy right now. You're obsessing over your job right now, that you're working 15 more hours than you need to just to protect yourself from something that you don't have the control over. Obsession, obsession, obsession. But here's how God wants us to live. Observe, but don't stop living. Yeah. Observe, but don't obsess over it. Here's the third thing that we must do is we must decide to be diligent. So he says, if you're, going to deal, if you're going to do this, if you're going to live a life where you overcome fear and uncertainty, he says, in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not let your hand rest because you don't know which will succeed, whether one or the other, or if both of them will be equally good. In other words, he says, get out there, get in the dirt, do something with life. Be diligent. Here's what I've come to find. Diligence is our defense against fear and uncertainty. 
Diligence is the antidote to the distraction of fear and uncertainty. And I actually think the reason that so many people are losing their minds and going off the rails is because they've stopped being diligent with the things they need to be diligent with. Come on, how many of you know when you're doing stuff, you don't have time for the nonsense? Right now, I'm trying to lead a church. I ain't got time for nonsense. I'm trying to lead my family. I don't have time for nonsense. I have dedicated these three things to this year and the years going forward. I want to be a faithful pastor to this church. I want to be a faithful husband to this woman. I want to be a faithful father to my three children. And guess what I'm doing every single day when I get up? Faithful pastor, faithful husband, faithful father. I'm not, I'm not doing anything else. Not in that particular order. That's just the the collection of my life. So I'm going to be diligent with my marriage. I'm going to be diligent with my family. I'm going to be diligent with this church. I ain't got time for fear and uncertainty because I am practicing, come on somebody, diligence. Last one's this. We must decide to be a people who celebrate. Less practical. Some of us don't know how to do this. Ecclesiastes 11.7. Light is sweet and it's pleasing for the eyes. Come on, those of us who actually live in winter, we know what this means. <laughs> it's pleasing for the eyes to see the sun. Yeah. How many of you know when March rolls around, all of us are like, oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Sunshine, it exists. My son said the other day, I was like, are you excited to go back to school? He's like, no. I was like, why? He's like, because it means winter's coming. <laughs> That's what he said. He wants to go to school. He doesn't want winter. Many of us recognize that, like there's a brightness that comes to our life when we see the sun. In other words, Solomon's saying there's a brightness that comes to your life when you celebrate. And some of you walked in here today and you said, I got no reason to celebrate. I'm clapping my hands. You don't know what happened yesterday. I ain't lifting my hands. You don't, you don't know what happened yesterday. And you're right. Can I just say this as truth? We all have lots of details in our lives that don't necessarily dictate a celebratory life. But there's one thing I do know, that for those of us who have said yes to Jesus, it doesn't matter about the details of the life that we have now, we still have something to celebrate. And it's this, I once was lost, but now I am found. I once was broken, but I have been put back. Oh, come on, somebody. I may not have everything I want in this life, but I have eternity to come. Oh, you got something to celebrate. You have something to clap your hands for. You have something to lift your hands to heaven for. What is it? It's that I was lost and now I am found. I was broken and now I can see. You got something to celebrate. The question is, is is that thing on your lips to shout? Some of us need to get our hallelujah back. Some of us need to get our hands clapping back. Some of us need to dance our feet a little bit more. Some of us need to get the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Why? Because you have something to celebrate. So the psalmist writes this, chapter 16, verse five, he says, Lord, you're my portion. This is the psalmist doing exactly what I'm talking about right now. Lord, you're my portion. You are my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I will always let the Lord guide me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices and my body also rests securely for you will not abandon me to shield. You will not allow your faithful to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. And at your right hand, come on somebody, our eternal pleasures. Can we give our God a massive shout of praise right now? So Jesus, we worship you. We praise you, not because everything is working out, but because you are faithful to work all things out. God, we don't know what tomorrow brings, but we do know that you hold it all. So today we are deciding that we will not be shaken. In 
Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around right now, if you would say, that's all well and good, Jason. But I don't even know where I'm at with Jesus. I want to invite you to do something. And it's the most important something that you will ever do. And that is actually saying yes to this Jesus that we've been talking about all day today. In both of our auditoriums, I want to invite you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's already done it. He's already paid the price. The question is, is will you acknowledge him as God? Will you acknowledge him as Savior? And if that's you today, I want to invite you to pray a prayer with us today, all of us together, so we don't leave anybody out. But if you'd say, man, I need Jesus as my Lord, as my King and as my Savior, make this your prayer today. Both of our rooms, I would ask that you'd all repeat this out loud after me so we don't leave anybody out as loud as you can. Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me, change me, and make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm gonna follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' mighty name.